um, background uh, to this uh, project. Basically, um, we do believe uh, in a certain additional value of instructor video. That is something that you can dispute, but let's not do that at the moment. Basically, we think that there, are, there is some additional value, and um, there's at least a couple of uh, instructors who do so, um, in that they ask for, for their video to be recorded. So um, basically, that means that uh, instead of what we saw from the University of Manchester, uh, we do believe in an additional value of, of dual stream video. Now, um, many of you, or some institutions at least, will use an overview camera, HD camera, in order to capture that video. Um, we, however, believe that uh, in order for the value to be increased, you need something that is similar to a camera person in the classroom. And basically, um, that's not Benjamin, by the way. That's uh, unfortunate over there. <laughs> <coughs> Basically, this is, this is to visualize the difference between a total shot and uh, a close shot here of, of the lecturer, irrespective of what the information is. The closer you can get, the more information you convey per, per square centimeter, whatever you have. Um, so um, we wanted to reduce also the, the cost in standard production. So basically, if you want a good shot of the lecturer, uh, you would need a camera person. And depending on your local production costs, this might uh, sort of become expensive. If you are in Switzerland, like we are, this becomes very expensive. So we were thinking of doing something um, with respect to uh, daily productions in order to reduce cost there. And there's also uh, an already an existing solution at ETH Zurich, which I'm not going to show right now because I don't want to jeopardize uh, the connection I have with uh, Rüdiger, uh, with, with Benjamin here, um, you can go to the, to the URL we'll, uh, we'll talk about in a minute in order to show, uh, to look at the, the examples from ATR. Basically, the problem with the existing ATR solution is that it's not open source. It comes from, uh, uh, from surveillance technology, um, but we are quite happy with the results we have at the moment, and we would like to, to have something like this in, in an open source environment, of course, and um, in order for this to work with Matterhorn as well, but not only with Matterhorn. So um, we were int very interested to see that Benjamin was doing his uh, master thesis, no, bachelor th thesis, I think, um, with respect to um, this subject of, of uh, tracking people. And uh, we started the cooperation with uh, Osnabrück and ETH, of course, uh, a couple of months ago. Camera tracking in the lecture hall, um, hardware agnostic, um, which is not really true, but in some respects it is. Um, it has to be adaptable to the room and its dimensions or settings. So basically, uh, you will have to do some some adaptions um, depending on, on the depth of the of the room or uh, other settings that are relevant in that uh, in that context. It has to be unobtrusive, so the lecturer shouldn't be wearing anything. No necklace, no nothing. Basically, he shouldn't even notice being recorded. That's our uh, superior goal always. always. And it should be affordable, of course. Um, and I'm already mentioned it should be open source. Um, there are some alternatives, of course. You can look at some of examples of people working with uh, Microsoft's Kinect solution there. Vadio has an auto track system. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, whether you know this, but uh, it's based on infrared um, detection. You have to wear a belt, and it's $15,000. So that doesn't meet most of our goals. Um, the audio auditorium system, uh, I do mention here, though I think there's still a question around the tracking to be answered on list, uh, Mike. I'm not sure. Um, I seem to remember there was one. Um, and, of course, you can do a totally different approach in that you do uh, cropping in post-production. So you do an HD recording, and then you have all the time to do this uh, afterwards. But we wanted to have something that is sort of live and thus reduces the time to, um, for the product to be released. Um, we have some known issues we wanted to overcome. The late student is certainly something that, that uh, bothers us. Um, so someone w walking by uh, in a situation like this one. 
uh, two or more instructors and smoothen the overall movement of the camera and of course increase the robustness and uh, these were the goals that uh, Benjamin had to tackle with uh, his project and I'm gonna skip over to Skype so you can hear him hopefully go ahead Benjamin yes hello um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical part of the whole stuff. <clears throat> Olaf um, is doing the management, as you noticed, and let me just that one. And I am the technician behind this stuff. So um, basically, what uh, t um, the first question is: What technologies are we using? Um, Lecture site is an OpenCast Matterhorn affiliated project. It's a friend project. Um, it is supported by the OpenCast community, so we stay uh, close to the Matterhorn technology. Uh, Matterhorn is based on uh, Java and especially the OSGI framework. It's a service oriented architecture, which is um, not the only reason. Uh, so, uh, being close to Matterhorn, uh, maybe even um, running lecture site uh, inside the Matterhorn capture agent, inside the whole um, OSGI container, uh, is not the only reason why we chose uh, OSGI. We also choose OSGI because um, it should be an open source project, <coughs> lecture site, and OSGI is, is a pretty good thing. It has a steep learning curve, but uh, once um, you are uh, a little bit um, in the flow, you can uh, really easily produce like uh, modules you can stick together to uh, achieve new functionality or to um, port functionality to other systems. Um, the next big uh, technology we use in lecture site is OpenCL. It's um, maybe uh, some of you know it's uh, a um, general purpose GPU computing standard. So uh, you can use whatever OpenCL um, certified hardware um, you want to you want to use. Uh, why did we why did we do that? Because we want to be unobtrusive. That means um, we have to do um, passive tracking. And passive tracking just means image processing, and image processing in real time. So um, we need a lot of speed. We need a lot of resources for calculations, because um, image processing always is uh, pretty resource heavy. So we choose to shift the whole image processing to a piece of hardware that is basically designed for doing uh, fa very fast image processing, namely the GPU. And uh, OpenCL comes in handy um, for that. Um, by the way, OpenCL compatible hardware is uh, today less than 50 bucks, and um, I'm working uh, for myself. I'm working on two and a half year old NVIDIA graphics cards, which are more than sufficing for um, our for our approach. And um, last te big technology you should know about lecture site is the uh, Visca protocol from Sony. We use. Um, it's a um, standard protocol that's used on all, um, at least all Sony, uh, but also from other windows, PTZ cameras uh, for controlling all the functions. <clears throat> so, um, as I mentioned, we are doing uh, passive tracking. It's um, maybe um, maybe Mike Bianchi knows it. It's uh, based on, on um, some kind of a background model approach mixed um, of, of a very dynamic background model approach mixed with a um, change detection in the scene and um, probabilistic, uh, probabilistic method to judge if um, a change is um, belonging to a foreground object or not. And we also have feedback mechanisms so that, uh, for example, the object tracker, if um, the object tracker identifies a foreground region as being definitely in, uh, an object of interest or region of interest, it communicates that down the hierarchy so um, that the foreground model is uh, sure that that uh, the region shouldn't shouldn't be discarded and um, stuff like that. It's uh, basically what I've done in my bachelor thesis. Now, what um, comes on top is the camera control <coughs> lecture site. A, a PTZ camera is controlled by its own. You can call it camera operator. We call it steering worker. And um, it's an independently running thread that uh, 
that um, on itself decides uh, if correction moves are necessary and um, in which speeds uh, they should be carried out. Um, you just give the steering worker a position and a zoom factor where it should drive to and um, it cares for itself to do so. Um, yes, so uh, next and last point is customizing lecture site. Um, we have a little UI for this. Um, as you can uh, as you can see, there are um, you can define areas in which um, the video processing um, shouldn't even happen. Uh, you can define areas where uh, people should be tracked, and you can also define trigger areas um, that trigger something. And this something uh, that can be programmed by yourself because we have included a little JavaScript engine and the actual camera control strategy um, is formulated in a little JavaScript. And um, from the JavaScript, you have access to the video analysis API and to the camera control API. And um, also, of course, um, um, the, to the scene model. And based on that, you can, um, you can decide in the JavaScript um, what to do for the camera. Now, what we are showing you um, in a few moments in the video is a very, very basic camera operator strategy that, that, uh, that just uh, picks up the target, whichever is, uh, uh, or, or whoever is, is first in the scene is picked up, um, is tracked uh, uh, until, um, the person, uh, until the person is, uh, is lost. And um, that's basically it. So um, the camera strategy you see now is just um, keeping the person, the first person uh, the system picks up um, in the field of view of the PTZ camera. There are more complex scenarios um, that you could uh, think of and the, uh, that we are already experimenting with. Uh, for example, um, driving the camera to a certain position um, when um, the the person, the lecturer, um, is um, uh, situated in a certain place in the scene. For example, um, at the left of the middle blackboard, so the camera shows um, the left half of the middle blackboard. Um, those are strategies we want to try out in, um, in, in uh, lectures uh, next semester, and hopefully or definitely you will get to see demo videos from those scenarios too. Perfect. So I guess it's time for the video. Yeah, the video is running, Benjamin. Thank you. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's why you are doing the management. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we had some problems with uh, the video running, starting, and it's uh, running now. Can you explain maybe the, the three different areas we have uh, we can identify in this? Yeah, so um, that um, red strip down there, uh, you can see um, it's the... Uh, it's the image from the overview camera. We have cropped it here a little bit, so it all fits uh, into this uh, tiny resolution. And um, and uh, as you see, the tracking, the object tracker is working uh, on the overview video. It's uh, just from an ordinary 90 bucks um, HD webcam. Uh, as though it's, uh, it is not a, it is not in HD. Uh, it's a, a little bit of uh, on top of VGA resolution that suffices. Um, um, in the upper right, this is what what's interesting. This is uh, just the output of the PTZ camera uh, captured with a um, with an ordinary frame grabber and and displayed via VLC player. And a little bit more interesting part is the upper left window. It's the PTZ control window where you can see a visualization of the, um, what the steering worker is uh, doing. So um, the yellow, yellow diamond is the target position and the blue diamond is the actual position of the camera. Um, we update this, I guess, 20 times a second and um, the steering worker is constantly deciding what to do, if uh, to stop, if to slow down, if to speed up, and in which direction to go. And now those, uh, this, um, this uh, has two benefits. Uh, the first one is 
you get, uh, for example, you see me um, in, in a short moment, you can see me running in the scene, I guess. So um, it's obvious um, that the camera worker should adapt to certain speeds, but um, the, the, um, the behavior of the steering worker we have right now also has the benefit of, um, of, of um, slowing down when the camera is closing into target. And um, to just um, to to uh, take a little um, to take a very slow velocity for uh, only small adjustment moves. Okay, thank you, um, Benjamin, for presenting the video and commenting on it. Uh, that's it, basically. Thank you um, here locally. Um, I think we will go to the next presentation immediately, and you can go to bed, Benjamin. Unless, uh, unless there is one question we can allow um, while we change uh, the uh, computer here. Hi, Mike Bianchi here. Uh, how do you decide what a human is in, the, in, those, in that image processing? Um, I guess Benjamin is not connected anymore, so. Oh. <laughs> but Thank I can you. answer your question. So uh, we do. Um, some statistical analysis about the object that is moving. So we have a moving area that we extracted from the background model. And um, so uh, we look for not really a shape of a human, but a typical upright uh, position. So uh, if, for example, it would be larger or a circle, more or less. It would not work. And then we try to find a head by uh, simply looking if there's an, where's the highest point in this, as we expect that the camera is not <laughs> turned around or something like this. And um, so um, it's a very basic identification of a person. And for um, later on recognition of this object, we, uh, I'm not sure if he already implemented it or not, have a histogram of the colors. Uh, so that the, um, the moving person can be um, yeah, re, uh, 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 recognized again. Okay.